We are in elementary. <coughs> we are in our new series, Elementary. Uh, we are going over what Scripture calls the fundamental truths that we need to understand. Uh, and one of the things, I hope I haven't said this because I have led you astray if I have. These are not simple truths, as I have discovered. These are fundamental. They are hugely important for us to understand, but they are not simple. And as I was preparing for this morning, I realized that simple is certainly not the word to use when I think about um, today's lesson. Um, And as we go through, there is depth and complexity and so much to these six things that Hebrews lists off as our fundamental truths, but they are fundamental and they are important and foundational, and we need to fully grasp what they, um, what they are. Uh, before I go too much further, for everyone tuning in on the podcast and everyone in Redverse, um, we have a special guest joining us next week. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Martini, who is the president of Horizon College and Seminary, uh, called me this week and apologized for being super last minute, but he is doing a tour through Manitoba and wanted to know if he could stop by. And there are few people in our district that I would rearrange everything for, and Dr. Jeremy Martini is one of them. Uh, He is, as I said, he's the president of our college, and he is one of the big brains that helped re- I want to say rewrite, but kind of refine our statement of faith over the last several years. And so it is always a privilege and honor when we have someone of that caliber come and share his heart. Um, And the reason I wanted to share this with Redverse is because next week is also Potluck Sunday, uh, we will not have service at the Redverse campus next week. We are inviting everyone to come here to hear Dr. Jeremy, to be in person. So uh, we're going to have a big family service next week. So no service in Redverse next week. Everyone here in-house um, for our special guest. So with that, uh, we are going to dive into lesson two of our series If you didn't know, it comes from Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. So we talked about last week, repenting from evil deeds and unpacking everything that that is. And this morning, we're looking at faith in God. So what is faith? How does it work? Um, Oh, of course, I didn't share this with, put this on the screen. Um, According to the Lexham Theological Workbook, uh, faith refers to a sense of trust, guiding belief, faithfulness, and often a committed sense of loyalty. So I'll say that again. Faith refers to a sense of trust, guiding belief, faithfulness, and often a committed sense of loyalty. Uh, the Lexham Bible Dictionary adds, re- faith is reliance upon and trust in God, a central emphasis in Christianity. A central, this faith is a core thing, doesn't matter what church you go to, doesn't matter what version of scripture you read, uh, faith is this big thing that comes up, especially in the New Testament, um, is huge. And so both sources mention this word trust, and I want you to keep that in the back of, our, back of your heads as we talk about what faith is and how it plays out in our lives, I want you to kind of have faith and trust as these interchangeable words. Because I think trust is a major part of what it means to have faith in God and faith in His Word and faith in His people. Um, Yeah. The other words that come up is faithfulness, loyalty, reliance upon. Uh, These kinds of words should stir in us the idea of relationship. Right? We need to be able to rely on one another in relationship. We need to be faithful in our relationships. Good friendships are founded on loyalty, that you're not going to go behind someone's back and backstab them or say something about them. Um, And so these things 
are all part of this great big word that is called faith. And as I was preparing for this morning, I realized I think what has happened over the years with this word faith is we've tried to simplify something that is complex. And one of the things I'm going to suggest this morning is that there's three kind of aspects, there's three dimensions, if you will, to faith. And I think what happens is when we're trying to explain what faith is to somebody, we maybe key in on one thing, and we key in on it, and it's a good thing to key in on, but we forget the other two parts of it. And what we need to remember this morning is that faith is complex. It is a big concept. We need to understand everything that faith is. And as we do, it's going to have big impact on uh, the way we live our lives, the way we see the world. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, we are in Hebrews 11, the good faith chapter. If 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter where Paul explains what love is, uh, Hebrews 11 would be the faith chapter. Uh, and I love what the authors of Hebrews does in Hebrews 11, because he doesn't just take the chapter and try to explain what faith is. He actually looks at the people of Scripture and says, this is faith in action. And so we're going to take some time, we're going to look at a few of them, and see how these different parts of faith are lived out in each of these people. So Hebrews 11, starting on verse 1, this is what the author says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. Read it again, because believe it or not, all three aspects of faith are on display in these two verses. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. So the first aspect of faith from that. Uh, number one, I'm going to use some big words. I promised myself in Bible school I'd never use big words in my preaching because um, who's going to remember these words, honestly? But I wanted to give you the kind of the framework of the theology. So here's the big word, but then I need you to remember the breakdown of it, the simple, simplified version of it so that we understand what is going on. So the first aspect is eschatological faith. Yes. <laughs> big word. Uh, but basically it means faith in the unseen future. Oop. And this is the hope of everyone that is a Christian. At some point in our faith walk, we were at church and somebody explained to us that when you become a Christian and you're saved from your sins and you're created to be new, the hope of our salvation is that at the end of our lives, we will enjoy eternity future. Right? We're, eternal life is part of the package. And even though eternity is a long ways away for some of us, right? we don't know the number of our days, there's no, uns there's no certainty, we can't see what's coming, because God has promised it abundantly in Scripture, we have this unseen future that we hold on to. It is the hope of our salvation. In fact, Paul goes so far to say in 1 Corinthians that if we lose this hope, then we as above all people should be pitied because it's the one thing that should fire us up. We have this hope of an unseen future. We have this hope that God has our, has our days in his hands. In, first, in Psalm 139, it says, God planned every one of our days before we were even lived one. And when we were being formed in our womb, our future was in God's hand. And even though we only experience time a day at a time, we hold on to the hope that God has good things in store for us. We hope that the next day is going to be good. The next day is going to be good because we're faithful and God loves to bless his people. Faith is the evidence, is the reality of things hoped for. Faith is, the, is a faith in an unseen future. Number two, epistemological. Yeah, let me show you that one fast. 
I once heard a professor tell me that if you have trouble with these big words, just say them fast and loud and nobody questions you. It's just, that's the key. So the same thing with dinosaurs. If you're hanging out with your kids or your grandkids and you have to say a dinosaur name, just say it fast and loud and they'll never question you. Um, but this is faith in what we cannot see. And we have, a, we have faith, we trust in a God that we cannot see. In fact, no one's ever seen him. The closest anybody in all of human history has ever gotten to seeing God face to face was Moses on Mount Sinai. And even then, God put his hand over the cave Moses was in. Because if Moses would have seen the face of God, he would have died. Because of Moses' sinfulness and God's holiness, he could not see God face to face. And so we have faith, we have trust in a God that we have never seen. Why? Because we read about him in his word, we see the ways that he moves, and one of the things that we, we get, for lack of better words, when we become a Christian is we see the world a different way. Paul, saw, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we live by believing and not by seeing. Some translations will say that we live by faith and not by sight. And what Paul isn't saying is that we ignore the things that we are seeing, but that God, by his Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we see the world differently. It's why each and every one of us can look at a situation and see that God is at work when the rest of the world misses it. It's why we can look at creation and see order and purpose and beauty where the world sees chaos. It's, it's this spiritual perception that allows us to see what God is doing when the world is ignorant of the fact that there isn't even a God at work. It is faith in the unseen. It's the ability to see God at work when nobody else can. Number three, covenantal. I think we can all say that one. Covenantal faith. Uh, faith demonstrated through obedience. And this is a majorly an Old Testament idea, <coughs> but it hasn't gone away. And it's this, to kind of help explain it, I want you to picture a wedding ceremony. Now most of us have a wedding ceremony in our, in our past that we can relate back to. If you can't, then just imagine one from a movie or whatever. Um, but the bride and the groom come up on the stage. And what is one of the major parts of the wedding ceremony? We have the scripture, we have some prayers, maybe there's some worship song. But then there is the vows. And what are the vows? The vows are the bride and the groom making promises to one another. Right? It usually includes something like, I forsake all others, and I will be with you, I will love you, I'll hold you in richer and poorer and sickness and in health till death do us part. And that's a super simplified version, but that's essentially what the vows are. Is it's this commitment to one another. It's this commitment that because of the relationship we're entering into, we're going to make promises to each other, we're going to commit to one another, now imagine if uh, you're, sta- you're sitting in a wedding ceremony and, because the bride always goes first, the bride makes all these beautiful vows to the groom that she's going to live this way, she's going to honor him in this way, and uh, the groom responds by saying, uh, cool, yep, sure, sounds good, move on. Right? He makes no vows of his own. Well, that would, that would not work. That would be a massive problem. And this, I think, sometimes is what happens sometimes in our faith. When you declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and God does this great and amazing thing in you, one of the things that changes in your life is you become a son or daughter of the living God. You enter into relationship with God. And whether we know it or not, it's a covenant relationship. It's been paid for by blood of the one and only Son of God on the cross. And because it's a covenant relationship, there's an agreement between you and God. 
And God has made promises that God is going to do things for you. He's going to bless you. He's going to go before you. He's going to make crooked paths straight. He's going to do great and amazing things for you. God has made these promises. Scripture is full of the promises of God. He has made vows to you. But on the flip side, we don't get off easy. There is, we, have a, we have to make our own vows. We have to make our own commitments in this relationship. And the big commitment is, is that we will live in obedience of Jesus' teachings. That we are going to live different. We're going to put off the old self as Paul says, and we're going to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. We're going to live differently. We're going to put off sin. We're going to forsake sin, and we're going to embrace the good things of God. Faith, and Jesus says this in John, he says that if you love me, you're going to obey my commands. Faith is, uh, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, Faith is the evidence of things unseen, and faith is demonstrated through obedience. It's, it's demonstrated in us living out this new life that we have in Christ and Christ alone. And I think this is that third one is the one that we wrestle with because Paul so often says that we are saved by faith. Yes, we are saved by faith because we have now, God has done something in us. He's changed us. He's made us new. And we are going to live differently as a result. It's not just, it starts with declaring with our heart, declaring with our mouth and believing in our heart that Jesus is Lord. But then it's lived out daily through the sanctification, through our working out our salvation with fear and trembling because we love our God we're in this relationship with him and we want to honor him in every way it's not one or the other it's all three of these things combined so to close the message we're going to go through a couple of the um, couple of the stories in Hebrews 11 and we're going to see if we can identify what aspect of faith is at work? What is it that the author of Hebrews is trying to highlight um, in this particular passage? So verse 3, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we see, what we now see, did not come from anything that can be seen. That was painful as I read that. Um, what aspect of faith is at work here? By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. This is the, that spiritual perception. Romans 1 talks about how we know that we can see God's handiwork, we can see God's divine attributes because of creation. Creation declares the good things of God. What is seen testifies and is witness of the things that we cannot see. So it's that faith perception. And I talked about it earlier. When we look at creation, we can see order and purpose where others only see chaos. So it's that second aspect, faith in what is unseen. Verse 4, It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example. What aspect of faith is on display in the story of Abel? What's the covenant? It's faith through obedience because he understood that I am in this relationship with God. God has promised good things to me and I'm going to do good things for him. You could also make an argument that he is... Um, it's faith in the un, um, unseen future uh, in the sense that he is giving, he sees that the good things that God has given him is a gift from God and he takes the best of it and he offers it back believing that if God has given him good things once, God's going to give him good things again. But again, it's that faith, it's that trust in what is unseen, but it's ultimately in his obedience. 
verses 5 and 6. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For because he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So there's kind of two things. But what about Enoch? What aspect of faith is in display in Enoch? Again, it's the obedience, right? He, he was known as somebody who pleased God. And we should live our lives for an audience of one. It's, there's so many different perspe- perceptions. There's so many different pressures in life. And God says there's only one person you need to be worried about. There's only one relationship that you need to put above all else, and that's the relationship that you and I have. And Enoch did that. Enoch was known as a man who pleased God. He was known as a friend of God. And because of his obedience, because of his relationship, he was seen as this good person, set apart from the rest of humanity. He's the only one, one of the only ones, who has never died. But the author of Hebrews actually takes Enoch and he goes in the next verse and he says he puts all aspects on display. He says it's impossible to please God without faith because you need to have this epistemological faith. You need to believe that the God you cannot see is there. And the eschatological, you have to believe that God wants to reward those who seek him. This unseen good future that we believe that God wants to bestow on us. All three on display in those two verses. Hebrews 11, 7, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. This is hope or faith in the unseen future. Imagine being Noah. You're in the middle of the desert, And not only is there supposed to be a flood coming, it's never rained on the earth before. At this point in creation, it talks about how there would be a dew would rise up from the ground to water the the plants. It had never rained. The idea of a flood was completely foreign to the people of the earth at this time. And here's Noah, boom, building a boat in the middle of a desert, telling everybody to repent because... Rain's coming. What's rain? What are you talking about, Noah? Verses 8 to 10. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations designed and built by God. It's interesting that Abraham arrives. Again, this is eschatological. He's hoping for a future that he, he never did see. He arrives in the land that God promised him and If you and I arrived in property that God promised us, the first thing we're probably going to do is build a house, a permanent structure. This is mine because God has given it to me. And what does Abraham do? What does Isaac do? What did Jacob do? They continued to live in tents. Why? This is your land. Because they understood that something better was coming. They understood that that God meant something more than just them and themselves and their kids like we're going to enjoy this now no we're going to live as foreigners we're going to live because god has something bigger in mind and their hope was actually in the fact that not just a physical kingdom they were actually hoping for a spiritual kingdom that god would come and establish the kingdom of heaven on earth and that's what they were looking forward to a city built and established by god That's what they hoped for. And so they just stayed in tents waiting for God to show up and do his thing. Hebrews 11 and 12, it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. 
A nation with so many people like that, the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore, there's no way to count them. Sarah at 90 years old, Abraham at 100 years old, when everyone else would have given up. Faith in an unseen future. Faith that their son, that God promised them, was going to come. And that everything that God promised them was going to be accomplished. Trust in an unseen God to accomplish an unseen future. Uh, we're going to skip ahead. Um, so that is like a quarter of Hebrews 11. There's a lot more going on in there. My challenge for you this week would be to take Hebrews 11 and see if you can identify what, what aspect of faith the author is trying to highlight with each and every one of the people he talks about. It's one thing for me to do it. But this is that whole getting your teeth into the meat of Scripture, getting your teeth in the meat of theology. That is not me taking it, digesting it, giving it to you, but for you to dive in and actually dig it out and find the good stuff for yourself. But I want to close with this, because the, the question is, okay, so now we understand faith, so what? What difference does it make? What does this, what does all, everything we just talked about, what implication does it have for our day-to-day life. Well, there's a couple of big implications. Number one, it's the reminder that faith is all about relationship with Christ. That because of what Jesus has accomplished for you on the cross, it is a call for us to live in light of that sacrifice, to live in a way that honors God and honors Jesus for what he did on the cross. It's not just same old, same old, but that because of what has been done in us, we are different, we're set apart, and we're going to live accordingly number two is a reminder that we have been given the ability to see god at work in our world what others can't and maybe it's a reminder that we need to be more sensitive we need to ask god to open that eye to open those eyes to open that spiritual perception to see god at work where others are missing it to see god doing things when Our physical eyes say, it's hopeless, it's done, it's not happening. God, give me eyes to see what you're doing behind the scenes. God, give me eyes to see how you are working all of this out to the good. Because I believe I am called, and your word says that you work all things to the good of those who are called. So God, give me eyes to see how you are going to pull this all together. It's a reminder to never lose hope. That no matter how life may be going, no matter how tough the current situation may be, we have a hope in an eternity future. That eternal life doesn't start when we die. Eternal life started when we gave our life to Christ. And God has this kingdom. Jesus says he goes to heaven to prepare a place for us. And so our hope is that one day we're going to enjoy that place. We're going to enjoy heaven where there's no more sickness and no more pain and no more fighting. and no, Nothing that is wrong with the world is there in heaven. So this is our hope. This is the thing that we hold on to and may it never be taken away from us because our faith is in this unseen future that God is going to accomplish all that he says he's going to accomplish. So what difference does it make? It should make a world of difference. We should be set apart because of the faith that we have because it calls us to be different.